Hi, everyone. So our next talk will be, so you want to build an API by Megan Spear. Um, if you have any questions after the talk, please use the microphone up front. Also, um, I have Gabriel Pratt's lunch ticket, so if you're Gabriel, please see me after the talk. Thanks. Um, please give Megan a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Let's get started. I'm Megan Spear, and I'm currently living in San Francisco, California. I'm a software engineer, and most recently, I've been building a company with my husband, wherein I became obsessed with API design and implementation. This is technically my first PyCon, and I'm really excited to share it with you all. Hopefully, everyone in this room has seen the movie Good Burger, or this talk is going to be a bunch of nonsense with some API information on the side. So you want to build an API, huh? Well, this sounds like a good idea. And Armin Ronecker, the creator of Flask, says, if you're not building an API, you're doing it wrong. So let's get started. What we're really going to talk about today is a web API using the REST protocol. We're going to look at the best practices of designing a web API and the patterns in Flask we may use to get there. And we'll actually be creating two APIs. As you are likely building a RESTful API for your JavaScript client, you're also building your own Python API for how you want to code it. We are doing this by leveraging patterns, because no one framework has everything you need. So yeah, that's two APIs, please. But first, where do best practices come from? They come from the saying, good artists copy and great artists steal. And this quote from Steve Jobs actually explains that popular Picasso quote. Ultimately, it comes down to taste. It comes down to trying to expose yourself to the best things that humans have done, and then try to bring those things into what you are doing. And where do patterns come from? Research. For me, this was a phase of trying to find out how things are currently done. If you don't know what current solutions are, how do you even know that you need to build a new one? As developers, we value laziness first. Why do something that has already been done? So you should know what other APIs are out there and how to use them. Learn how other people do REST in Flask. And stretch the imagination to guess at what people would try to build using an API. This is kind of like the old adage of um, knowing the rules before you can break them. But patterns also come from lazy developers who are smarter than you and me. I basically learned a lot from everyone else. Learn from these people, and you too will become lazy and smart one day. This is why there are so many frameworks and forks. Everyone wants to be lazy, but everyone is lazy in their own way. So in the end, choose your own flavor and your own set of tools. Maybe you really want your API to be written in Go or something, but you're all here, so I assume you love Python as much as I do. Developers and patterns are subjective. Decide what is important to you. Decide how you want to be lazy. Try all the tools. Sample all the things. It is only through this process that you will find what tastes right. But you must design the UI first. I think it was Kenneth Rates who said, write the README first. This talk isn't going to make all the problems in a current implementation of a web API disappear, but it will help you build better ones going forward and create documentation that is intuitive and easy to understand right off the bat. Um, this is certainly be best practice and helps to not make mistakes to begin with. Otherwise, your documentation and code might look like this, bad burger spaghetti code. It's important to stay organized. But wait, what is a web API? I haven't really said this yet. It's REST. REST, or representational state transfer, as described by Roy Fielding's dissertation, which is still kind of the definitive resource on the topic, is the architectural style of an API consisting of a handful of key elements, including data and the interactions we can make with that data. 
The first important part of a REST style web service is a bunch of resources it exposes. You can't see the resource. It doesn't actually exist. You just have to trust that it does. It is the intended conceptual target of a hypertext reference. Your API does not mirror your database. So for our Good Burger API, we might have customers, menu items, and burgers that are part of menu items. Resources represent the idea of things that will generally be a part of your API, which we can reasonably assume will be everything that I just mentioned. Next, we'll be designing an identifier. Those are resources. Those resources are exposed through resource identifiers. This is the first thing to design. Take, for example, the goodburger.com address, which represents our base URL that we can now build out using resource identifiers. This comes down to naming. Use your words. I mentioned that we probably have a burgers resource, which you want to be consistent and clear throughout your API. Another example would be how people popularly have slash users resource identifiers, where we have burgers currently. But I think person in that case, not user, is much more clear. They are users to everyone else, um, or they are users to you, but to everyone else they are a person. Be human and respect the people that use your service. This is an example of something that's just my opinion, my personal flavor, but once I've chosen it, I have to stick with it. So use your words to describe things, but understand that you yourself may not know what they are at first. So think hard and be concrete. Now we will look at some of the patterns in which we apply these best practices in code. One of the first things you'll need to make a decision on is what kind of routes to use. These are your regular old definition-based views. Fairly simple. Under the app.route here, you would clearly define HTTP method you wish to perform an action on our burgers resource, and in what resource identifier or URL we can access the data. But this can get a little unwieldy when you're defining multiple methods and resources along the way. Another pattern is class-based views, or pluggable views, as class refers to them, which have the built-in method view allowing you to create a single class of your resource menu API in this case, which would be a class with definitions for each of the HTTP methods to be used on the resource. Finally, you'll use the add URL rule to create the resource identifiers. You still have to register each one, but this is a little better because it's more extensible and allows you to use some of the cool functions in Flask, including decorators and things like that. But neither of these options was exactly what we were looking for, so we created Restyle by restyling these patterns in code to consolidate them. Cleverly named resource.identifier because this is literally what it is, the identifier representing a specific re resource. Another thing you're going to run into is consolidation and separation of services. Don't create latency and behavioral debt with HTTP redirects. Make smart de decisions up front so you don't mess with your developers. Avoid collisions between your variety of services. Prefixing is best practice. So here I've prefixed with api.goodburger.com slash burgers. It can help you test different versions of your API, among other things. So I mentioned versioning. Best practices for versioning means no dots. Use v1, not v.1. Use major versions only, v1, not v1.1. Don't get overly creative in naming versions. It's basically a more granular version of what you're doing with prefixing or creating a subdomain. You can move on to a new API and still provide support for an old one, but be decisive and clear when it comes to deprecation policies after releasing a new API. So this pattern shows hard coding the version directly into the URL. But this makes it too hard uh, to change. Treat versions more like a variable and keep the route short in code. You can do it in code with Flask blueprints, which make it easy to serve up different versions for different resources. Doing it in a blueprint will allow you to change it in one place. Blueprints can be a little confusing. Um, but I have a pretty simple blog post up on my blog. I didn't put that in here, but uh, on meganspear.com. Um, if Ed here can save the day at Good Burger, you can too. You'll eventually have a complete resource identifier. 
Ed with his mountain of burgers is a metaphor for all the exploration you should do to find your way in building things. Sometimes experimenting will surprise you. Next, you'll be concerned with how you are going to deliver all this information, all the burgers, to your end user. It will be through what is referred to as a representation. Fielding says, other commonly but less precise names for a representation include document file, an HTTP message entity instance or variant, which basically means it's what your user is going to see. Again, use your words. Naming and representations relates to a schema, which allows you to make decisions about renaming elements of your database models, grouping data in a logical manner, so the elements of a burger might consist of the name of the burger and its ingredients, which you could extend or remove based upon the type of burger that someone wants. So here we have a bun, two patties, and sauce for a double-double. Let's see how this looks in code. This is a template for the representation from code. You can create public and private schemas, which allow the data of your API to scale beyond that of your database. This involves creating logical chunks of data to talk about data elements. A little tip, don't force your users to live with the mistakes you made before you knew how to name things properly in your database. So this shows that it says code name in the database, which isn't as clear as burger name, which is in the public schema. Next, show errors for humans. If something goes wrong when your API makes a request, status codes and messages will be your friend. Some go in the header, which we will talk about in a moment, um, showing errors for code. And some go in the response body, showing errors for humans. I'll show you what to do and what not to do. First, these are real error messages. They are useless and give the developer no information. Bailing out, sorry dude, WTF just happened. That's something you might expect to hear when you see this. But you want error messages that Spatch here can understand. Don't confuse him or he might just eat a bug. For Spatch, <coughs> you want error messages that are verbose and provide much more information. Better errors explain the problem that is actually happening. Metadata is another important aspect of our API. Metadata is what allows REST to be self-descriptive. Returning raw data to the recipient along with metadata allows the recipient to work with the data as they see fit. So use formats. Fielding recommends the conversion of a resource into a standardized format based upon the capabilities of the recipient while not necessarily supplying multiple formats. In some of the examples thus far, I have used JSON, but there are others like XML. Um, and use relationships. Relationships are source links that may point to the raw form of the data in cases where it may have been converted. Alternates may indicate other forms in which data may be transformed, for example, into XML or TXT files or otherwise. Control data. Control data is data relevant to the transaction as, as you are making it, describing your ability to use the data at a certain point in time. It can be used to parameterize requests and override default behavior, but it is not the resource representation or metadata. Basically, you're just telling your user, yes, you can use this now. No, this isn't available to you right now. Headers. Of all the things you'll need to familiarize yourself with for an API, headers are extremely important. HTTP headers may hold a bulk of the metadata and control data and act as a transport layer, relaying information, either partially in the case of status codes for computers and error messages for humans, or completely in the case of authentication and cache control. What you may want, but what you might not need. There are plenty of patterns to deal with these headers or containers, one of the most popular being the decorator. However, the deeper you get into the specifications of headers, the quicker you realize you're modifying the header in so many places it's hard to keep track. It's also almost impossible to control the order they are appended in, and difficult to vary responses based upon 
the HTTP method used for the request, which is the correct way. So if you decide to go at it and roll your own solution for better decorating, consider this pattern. It is useful if you want a nicer way to handle headers. It allows for the headers to be ordered and can store the same key multiple times. Then you can attach or add all the headers just before you dispatch your response. So this is kind of using a dictionary list or list structure to add the headers. Cache control. You might also consider caching API requests, which would also go into the header to help load balance your API. So refrigerate after opening because you want to save it for later. Okay, we're almost through here, but there are a few things I'd like to mention before you walk out and go build your own API. Rate limiting goes into the header. Let your customers know where they stand by telling them how many API calls they can reasonably make within a set of constraints, paid or otherwise. This will help you detect problems with your API quickly if someone is trying to abuse it, which can happen even if you're not a public-facing API, so beware. And please, please put a heavy emphasis on security for your API. If you're really so lazy you don't want to bother with this, please don't make my heart bleed or anyone else's because there are API services out there that will handle authentication for you. But really just put some code in the header to get authentication up and running quickly. Some things I am not really going to expand upon here regarding our own implementation of restyle is that we've considered open sourcing the API. Um, but that's a lot of work. So if there's demand, we'll do it because we'd love to share our secret sauce with you. Um, this is pretty much all I have. I hope you've enjoyed the talk, uh, whether or not you've built an API before. I'm currently exploring new career opportunities, so if any of this was interesting to you, please come talk to me. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, this is a little bit out of my depth, but I'm curious whether um, I've heard a little bit about self-documenting REST APIs, and I was wondering whether there are any Flask extensions or recommendations you have about developing self-documenting. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, Sphinx I would use. Okay. So that's, that's the one that I've heard of and used before. But yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for the best yeah. practices and everything. It's really cool. Um, I was wondering uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about the authentication options that are out there in that world. Um, yeah. I don't have any specific examples with me, but I, I recommend using a service. I think like um, Stormpath or something like that might do that for you. Um, so I would do that. But that's because I'm a little lazy. <laughs> right. Thanks. Hi, thanks. I was wondering if you had any comments about um, maybe scaling an API? How many requests you can handle? How it would scale? You had problems with that? Yeah. I personally didn't have problems with that because we didn't end up releasing this or using it in, in a full production form. So I actually don't know a ton about that. But um, yeah, I would definitely do my more research before I let it go. <laughs> Uh, good talk, thank you. Excuse me. Um, do you have any tips for building the API client libraries is my question. Client libraries, like? Yeah, so like if you have an API and you want uh, people to consume it with a Python library as opposed to just doing pure REST stuff, do you have any like tips or suggestions or anything? So are you talking about like using requests or something like that? Yes, like okay. requests. Or yeah. yeah, that would be my number one go-to. Okay. okay, just checking. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah.
very much, Megan. Thank you.